Our core principles are faith, firm belief in something for which there is no proof. I'm sorry, y'all. Give me one second. Let me close this door. Let my dog go. Apologize about that. But uh, so uh, our core principle of faith is a firm belief in something for which there is no proof, complete trust. Number two is our uh, integrity, the firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values. Three, resilience, the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. That's thriving in spite of any circumstance. And number four is production. Production is the act or process of creating something of value, such as a good service, and specifically in the insurance adjuster industry, what we call closing the claim. Our business model at the 360 Adjuster Academy is to come follow your vision within our vision. To give a brief introduction and short history of my adjuster experience, my name is Kayvon Quasi Hill. I have been an adjuster for two years now. Uh, I, I would consider myself to be a seasoned adjuster, but I would at the same time <laughs> because, you know, I, I've been on multiple deployments and I, I, I've had you know, the opportunity to experience a lot of different things within this insurance adjuster industry when it comes to handling different type of claims, uh, all the way from farm and ranch claims where there's, you know, seven, seven structures all the way down to, you know, the simplest claims of handling, uh, you know, backup sewage drains, uh, when in hell, you know, I, I've been fortunate to get my experience and, and one specific about my first well, actually, I'm sorry. My second deployment, I I had to have I had the opportunity to handle multiple different type of claims, from wind and hell to backup sewage drains to freeze claims. So you know, I I I've, I've been very fortunate to gain a lot of experience within the, the the short amount of time that I had began being an adjuster. Uh, my first deployment was to Minnesota. Uh, I did go into I, I was deep into the, the boonies of Minnesota. I was close to South Dakota. And, you know, I got to experience uh, a, lot, a, a lot of different type of claims, you know. I, I did the, the the steep roofs, the tall roofs, the, the short roofs with the non-steep roofs. And one thing that I can say is that, you know, the this industry, there's a lot of challenges that you may face. But for someone, me personally, who... Uh, consider myself to be afraid of heights, you know, and I, I have had the pleasure of introducing insurance adjusting to a lot of uh, colleagues of mine, a lot of friends that I did, you know, know from the past and other uh, people that I did work with on previous jobs in my previous career. And, you know, that, that, that first deployment when you go on and you get to that roof, that's like two and a half stories tall, you know, go get there. You're going to be like, man, I can't do this, you know, or when you, when you look, open up that laptop and, you have 40 tasks and they're telling you, hey, I need you to call this amount of people in two days. And you're like, man, it's taking me 30 minutes to get one call done. You know, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be challenges. But one thing that I can say is that if I can do it, you can do it. You know, uh, when I first came into this industry, uh, I didn't know what to expect. There was a lot of, of things that I hadn't even thought about coming across as an insurance adjuster. Of course, you know, with it being the greater of a greater unknown of what what I'm going to be getting myself into when it's something new, you know, change is uncomfortable always. But one thing that I can say is that, you know, once you have that steadfast faith and you stand firm and believe it in yourself, that anything is possible. If I can do it, you can do it. You know, I'm no different than you. So. Uh, I, I definitely would like to, you know, also state again that me becoming an insurance adjuster, that was the, the best uh, decision that I've made in my entire life, just based off of the experiences that I've had, the places that I've been able to stay for an extended period of time, the people that I've met, you know, uh, one, one also good thing about the insurance adjuster industry is that, you know, when you get into a lot of career fields, I was just discussing with one of my friends not too long ago about things that we learned in school. He was like, you know, it took me a long time to understand calculus and, you know, figuring out how to find a slope, 
He was like, eh, I really don't understand why they teach us that in school. Like, well, I, I haven't had to use a scope in any way, in any career or job that I've done so far. It's like, that was pretty much pointless. But one thing that I can say about the insurance adjuster industry and speak, speaking on, you know, a brief history of myself is that everything that I've encountered that I've learned as an insurance adjuster is beneficial not only to my career, but to my life, you know? I'm pretty sure if, if some of us in here don't own a home, we all aspire to own a home at some point in our life. And, you know, it's inevitable that weather is going to, you know, it's going to weather. You know, Mother Nature is going to take its part. So, you know, one thing that I can't say about my insurance adjuster, you know, experience is that I'm, I'm truly happy that I did get the opportunity to, you know, be introduced to such an a industry because it, it's taught a lot about myself about my career, but also about things that I feel like I need to know as a young adult. And even if, you know, into my adult years, you know, uh, my, my father is actually facing something right now in Louisiana where he, you know, they had a hurricane down there. He's dealing with, you know, still repairing damages to his home. And, and contractors had the opportunity to, they kind of got over on him, told him that he needed to get specific things fixed in X, Y, and Z. He actually didn't need those things fixed when he got, got a different opinion on it. So uh, saying all that to say is that, you know, with my experience, the things that I've learned, I've been able to help others, specifically in my family, even my parent, you know. So uh, I have no regrets when it comes to choosing to be an insurance adjuster, you know, the, just, just on the personal level and also – and on the in the aspect of gaining knowledge about something that's also going to be valuable to me in the future. So with that being said, I would like to give insight onto what our topic of the month spring into action means for me. Of course, you know, it's perfect timing because we're 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 heading into you know the season of spring where you know everything is going to start to pick up. You know, in the wintertime, things are slow, uh, it gets cold. A lot of people face seasonal depression, you know, because it, it's getting dark earlier and it's cold. And, you know, a lot of times people get lonely. And, you know, we we get to a point where, you know, we we kind of slow things down in the winter. You know, a lot of times people state that the winter is where summer bodies are made, X, Y, and Z. But, you know, a lot of people don't take advantage of that. So, with that being said, I, I believe that our topic of the month, spring into the action, spring into action, is taking that slow period, taking that patient waiting period, and we're turning it into something where we're getting active, we're getting up, we're we're you know, uh, not wasting time, we're not procrastinating anymore. It's time to to get back to work. You know, even though that we haven't gotten those calls yet, it's time for us to mentally prepare to spring into action with our with our uh, thoughts. You know, spring into action with, with removing self-doubt. Spring into action with, you know, uh, not allowing ourselves to just be still and, you know, just stay in our own funk. You know, it, it, it's getting hotter outside. And, you know, of course, the heat is going to make you, you know, you're going to get out, you're going to want to go to experience nature. But let's, let's not look at it in the aspect of just the seasonal changes. Let's look at it into at, at the aspect of let's do it with our, our personal development and what we're doing with our lives and just taking advantage, just bringing it to action. So that's, you know, my insight on springing it to action. I would like to announce that we will have our, our guest, panel, uh, guest panel speakers today. It will be Mr. Well, I'm sorry, Dr. Travis Brock, Sterling Reed, and myself. We will have a guest panel today. So, uh, before we go ahead and transition over to Janae, I would like to give a reminder for everyone to fill out our feedback form. If you haven't, uh, we would truly appreciate that. We've been taking a look at our feedback forms and we're, we're seeing some of the things that you have been saying to us and we want to implement that into, you know, what we do in our, our Sunday gatherings. And also, uh, I would like to uh, just inform everyone in here, if you do have any questions that you need answers for, please feel free to drop them in the uh, Q&A chat. But with that being said, I would like to introduce a transition over to Janae. Uh, thanks, Kayvon. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, my service is not the best right now. Yes, you're good. Okay, awesome. Um, well, for starters, happy Sunday. Nice to see um, some of the familiar faces in here. 
Um, if you missed last week, I highly suggest to go on YouTube to rewatch that one because Meech did a great job of breaking down some of the equipment that's needed. So um, definitely go back and watch that and write down some of the stuff that he talked about because, again, a lot of it was really, really good, valuable information. Um, yeah, so the week has been, it hasn't been such a crazy week, although there was a few storms that were popping off. Um, I did want to mention this to you guys. Um, I came across this website called catadjusters.org. And if you check out their classified section, it's basically like jobs that they're posting from other, um, other uh, firms that are looking for daily claims in certain areas. And of course, um, when any deployments pop up, they're looking for people to enter their roster and stuff like that. So I've been kind of, you know, playing with that website a little bit. Um, like I said, that's called catadjusters.org. So check it out whenever you get a chance. Um, I'm not sure if anybody did anybody was anybody did excuse me did anybody get a chance to check out that flood like do that FEMA flood this week? I know I did. Oh Travis, you did as well. I'm not sure how many people was able to get on that. Was that with Crawford that we signed up with, Travis? Yeah, Crawford had one, and then it was also the FEMA had their own six hour course, so that was just FEMA. right. But I think like. Crawford may have sent it out or something like that. So if you wasn't able to do that, I highly suggest to get on that because um, we've already seen, there's a lot of flooding that's already been happening. And a lot of firms, uh, insurance carriers, excuse me, they don't cover flood. But obviously if you can get your flood license, then you know that's valuable because only the, I believe only the government really gives out those type of, um, those type of insurance, right? If I'm not mistaken. Um, but yeah, I would definitely check out that information when you can. Um, and um, for those that don't know, of course, my name is Janae. I've been adjusting. This is the start of my second year. And <clears throat> excuse me, I am so patiently waiting, starting to get a little antsy soon. But like Kayvon said, I feel it as well. Like things are really starting to heat up. So I'm definitely looking forward to um, receiving, you know, receiving some good news within the next few weeks. Um, all I can really say for everyone else is tighten up, you know, be ready, please. I don't want to hear any stories about, oh man, I missed the call. I missed this. Now is not the time for that. So like I said, just tighten up everything. And I really hope to see, you know, some of those deployments being handed out shortly. Um, with that said, I won't take up too much time. Um, Miss K Joy is going to be interviewing our guest panel speakers this week. Also next week, she will be the guest speaker um, and she'll be going over some really crucial things for you guys to, um, you know, get from the managerial side. So make sure you tune in next week as well. Uh, I'll go ahead and switch over to uh, Miss KJ so she can go ahead and get this panel popping for us whenever you're ready. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, all right, team. Well, we look forward to, you know, sharing some Q&As with y'all on the panel. Feel free, like Kayvon said, drop any questions you may have in the chat as well. Uh, but we'll go through a good series of some random questions for the panel. And then we definitely want to be able to answer questions in between. So please don't be shy. These questions just come from thinking about springing into action and things that we hope that you guys would want to hear and may be helpful to hear from a group of, you know, tenured adjusters of all tenure and different levels. So um, definitely keep us posted if there's more you'd like to know. All right. So we're going to start out with Mr. Sterling. Mr. Sterling, what did you take with you to your first deployment? Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> like, what do you mean specifically? Like, uh... So just think high level, you know, what did you, like, what did you make sure you had with you to go on your first appointment? So when we were packing okay. the car up, headed, what kind of things did you think of? All right. So I, I flew, my first appointment was in uh, Minnesota. It was, um, I spent a week and a half in Minneapolis and the rest of the time in Duluth. Um, so I flew there um, and I rented a car um, at the airport with um, Hertz, no, Enterprise. Um, so what, I, what did I bring with me? I made sure to bring uh, all my equipment, tape, tape measure, laser measure. You know, I bought chalk um, when I landed. Um, I went and bought, you know, polos, breakaway pants, 
uh, Under Armour, things of that nature that I could stay, you know, loose in and also like I wouldn't get hot in. Um, yeah, like essentials, you know, vitamins, toothpaste, all those things, personals, and that's pretty much it. And, you know, I brought my uh, I brought my Xbox with me uh, for entertainment purposes when I had downtown. Uh, and yeah, that's and definitely a, something a that you attitude. don't need with you. <laughs> for sure, definitely. Skip that yeah. last one for everyone else. Skip that last one. <laughs> you will have no time to play that at all. And, yeah, um, yeah, no, nah, no, nah, for sure. This is my, this is my, you know, my first deployment was very unique. So I'll throw that out there. So you know, what I'm saying what they're saying is very true. Uh, it don't depends on how you handle your business, though, because if you get yeah, your work, yeah. if you close it in the driveway and you close that laptop at six o'clock, you might have some time to play your game. I know I did. Yeah, right, that's, right. yeah, that's true. That's true for sure. All right, but you know, starting out, you know, what I'm saying for sure, you don't want that distraction. You know, what I'm saying. I was just in a, a unique situation. Understood. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hill, on to you, sir. What are the top two things after your first few deployments that you now know are must-haves that you didn't realize initially? Hmm. Top two things that I know that I must have. Uh, so these are two things that I must have on a deployment? Correct. Uh, so... Let me see. Top two things that I must have on a deployment. Hmm, that's a good question. For one, huh, I would say, and this is going to be interesting, I would say you must have an air fryer because you don't have time to really you know, cook. And and that and that's one thing that I wish I did have was an air fryer because I could go ahead and just pop something in real quick and it'd be done in a short amount of time. You know, we we have so much work and so many other things that we have to focus on that I wish I had, you know, that that device to where I could just pop something in really quickly. And I don't have to really watch it. You know, you don't have to stand over the over the stove and cook it. Go pop some in the air fryer real quick. And then, you know, I could go over there and close some more claims out, get whatever work, you know, make phone calls that have to get done. And then, you know, just go take it out. And that's dinner right there. So I see that's one unique thing that I wish that I had. And uh, number two, hmm. You gave me a tough question. Let me see. Two things that I wish that I had on a deployment. I thought we're um, gearing up. I, I I thought that was a gear up to where we're headed. So my yeah, <laughs> I wasn't trying because to because I, I feel I feel like you know what I had on my deployment was I pretty much had everything that I needed that was necessary. But initially, which is something that we spoke about last week, I did not have. Uh, the laser tape measure, you know? So mm -hmm. I'll say that that's something that I wish that I, you know, that I think that's very necessary to have on a deployment because my first couple of interior claims, I was in there with the, the traditional tape measure and something that mm -hmm. I could have accomplished in, you know, five to 10 minutes. It took me 45 minutes because I'm sitting there, you have to stretch it out and then, you know, say you're trying to you're trying to hold it up to measure how tall the ceiling is, it's falling, and you know, it's just it's a lot of extra stuff that you have to deal with when it comes to measuring the interior of a home. So I would say my air fryer and the, and the laser measure. Those those are two things that you know I know that you must have on a deployment for sure. All right, thank you, Mr. Hill. We appreciate it. Uh, all right, Mr. Travis, it's up your turn, sir. How do you prepare when you get a chance to leave for an assignment? So think of it from the perspective of, you know, or do you think of planning your route first, packing, like what, take us through the steps, a few steps. I know you can't take us through everything, but what are those top essential steps that you take when you're getting ready to plan to leave for assignment that have worked, you know, you've been in, in this for a long time, you mentor people. So what would be something you would think would be helpful for someone to know that maybe doesn't have a year tenure? 
So for myself, the first thing I do is stop, I pause, gather myself, and sit for a moment and realize why am I doing this? So I think about, I know it's about to be chaotic, lots of I have no control over, but I make sure my mind's prepared not to quit. Because I promise you, out in the field, when everything's on against you, a weak-minded individual will blow up. So the first thing I just stop, pause, I think about why am I doing this and get excited about that. And then I go to my bins that are already packed. So I make sure everything's already packed, all my um, all my uh, State Farm shirts or, or whatever carrier it may be, have all my polos. Then also I have all my khakis and my pants, I have all my work stuff packed in an in a, in a actual bin. My air fryer, one thing to have those uh, packed as well. My seasonings have those back. And then I'm able to pack my car very easy and efficiently because before my first deployment, I packed everything. It was ridiculous. I had all kinds of clothes that I just I was never going to wear. I all had suits. I had all kinds of stuff I just did not need. But once I went on a few deployments, I realized that I don't need that much stuff. And if I do need it, I can just buy it, all right? So the two things for me was just stopping, pausing, make sure my mind's together, making sure they have everything taken care of at home. Because as you guys know, when you get out there, you can't just go back home right away. You got to make sure that everything is together at home first. Make sure you make sure that all this is taken care of. All right. And then uh, make sure I and then go ahead and pack my vehicle up. And then I just hit the route and go from there. Thank you, Mr. Brock. All right, Mr. Reed, back to you, sir. What resources do you tend to review to keep your skills sharp during downtime or while on deployment? So I, I'm not sure if that's YouTube videos, if it's, you know, keeping in touch with the community here, you know, what is it for you though that works during those downtimes to help hone those skills? Um, you said it, YouTube. Um, <clears throat> and it's funny you asked me this because just today I was watching a series of uh, roofing videos, um, like from starter to expert, just, you know, going over parts of the roofs, you know, how roofs are made, you know, types of shingles, things of that nature, you know, uh, just trying to stay refreshed. Um, Kayvon and Major, uh, two of my really good friends I've been knowing and having since fifth grade. Um, when we get around each other, uh, I'm constantly picking their brain because, you know, they have a little bit more experience than me. So I'm just, hey, bro, uh, what am I supposed to do in this situation? Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like just having the adjusted conversation amongst each other um, and things like that. Uh, I think that helped me uh, stay prepared and uh, ready. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hill, you're up. So what do you take into account when determining to accept a rate for an assignment? Uh, okay, say that one more time. What do I take into account when to accept what? Or wait when for you, an assignment? When, what do you take into account when determining to accept a certain rate for an assignment? So when it comes to determining the money, you know, they call you with the offer of 350 a day, whatever, I'm just making something up, right? Composite, okay. non-component, uh, component, I'm sorry, non-component, different things like that. What do you sit down and, and really think out to determine whether that's a good fit for you? I just think that's okay. something that's really vital for people that are coming into this industry or that have been here to learn and understand, you know, different viewpoints of maybe things to ask about that maybe they maybe haven't thought about yet. Okay, so my my biggest determination would be experience. You know, um, they do offer like, well, I, I'll speak specifically for myself. You know, like I told everyone, you know, plenty of times before I, I acquired my adjuster license in September of 2021. I did my training, my state farm training in Dallas for a week. And they told me that, hey, you know, we have a deployment available with Hurricane Ida in Louisiana. You know, when you get done, you want to have a deployment available. When that happened, you know, I got to the end of the week. They didn't have that deployment available. So I had to wait a couple of months um, until I actually got offered a deployment that was going to stick. Now, initially, there were some deployments that were offered to me. They were like, hey, these deployments are component based. So once I got, you know, some more knowledge on what component based, you know, basically was, it's 
proponent is basically commission. You know, more people I feel like know what commission means. So it's based off of how many claims that you close, you get a, a percentage of it. So um, initially, I was like, do I want to go on a component commission based assignment? And I don't have an idea of anything that I'm going to go and do. You know, it's going to be, I'm going to get paid based off of how much I produce, how many claims that I close. So, um, I, I definitely was like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I want to go component based on my first assignment. So that's why I say expertise, because if you're someone that's new to the industry and you don't have a, a clue on what it's going to take to close a claim, um, you don't have a clue about anything about insurance adjusting. My, my biggest thing was, was expertise, you know, even after, you know, working my first one or two deployments that I did hourly, you know, I, I, I consider, you know, some people were like, man, you need to go component. You make way more money. And I'm like, yeah, like, you know, it sounds good that I can make way more money, but I'm like, even on these hourly component, uh, hourly assignments, sometimes it's still taking me two to three days in order to close a claim, you know, and, you know, I'm still trying to figure things out. So if it's taking me two or three days to close a claim at the end of that week, I'm potentially, you know, closing four claims in a week. And if I do that, you know, I'm not going to make even 15%, 20% of what I would make doing hourly. So I would basically say that, you know, uh, before you decide on, hey, if you want to take a component assignment, because of course, every, you know, people that's been doing insurance adjusting for a while, they're going to be like, hey, take a component assignment. You can make 50000 in a month. You can make as much as, you know, there's, there's no cap. There's no limit to how much you can make. It's all based off of how many claims you close. It sounds good and all until you get to that, that one claim that has that tree that fell in between the roof and you get there and you're like, I don't even know where to start. You know what I'm saying? And then you have other claims coming up after that, but you're not getting those easier claims closed because you're trying to figure out how to get this one that you inspected three days ago, you know, completed. So before you decide on if you're going to take an hourly pay rate or a component pay rate, I would decide, I, I would consider, um, what's my expertise? You know, do I know anything about insurance adjusting? No. If I don't, yeah, I'm going to just take this hourly because it doesn't matter if I close one claim in a week or 100 claims in a week. I'm still going to get paid regardless. You know what I'm saying? So I think that was the biggest thing for me. Like, I'm just now, you know, with me having my two years of experience, I'm just now at the point where I'm like, yeah, I don't think I want to do any more hourly, uh, any more hourly assignments because I know what I'm doing and I know that I can go and close three claims in a day. So I, I know I could go and make more in a week than I would make hourly. So it's all based upon, uh, you know, one of our core principles, which is production. You know, if, if you feel like you're confident enough to where, you know, you know enough to where you can produce and close a lot of claims in a week, hey, by all means, go take that hourly component. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, go take that component assignment. But if you're like, hey, I, you know, I'm not too sure. I'm still trying to figure things out. I would take the hourly pay rate. But um, in, in terms of like the specific number, um, I I haven't really uh seen any circumstances where I've been offered a deployment. They were like, hey, um, you know, we 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 have a deployment. They're seven twelve. The pay rate is thirty five dollars an hour. But you know, if you want to accept it, you can call in and we can negotiate your hourly rate. It doesn't typically go like that, you know. When they're offering a deployment, it's gonna be these amount of hours per day and th this amount of days in the week, you know, so there's no negotiation when it comes to that. But um, it, like I said, in relevance to just between hourly and component, I would definitely take hourly if you do not have a clue of what you're doing. Because if you go out there and you take component and you don't know how to close a claim and it takes you, you know, four days to close one claim, and you only close two claims in a week, you might as well stay home and, you know, go work at Walmart or something, you know, like not, not to knock anything like that, but you know, you might as well not even try adjusting because you're, you're not going to make 
the amount of money that, you know, that we often speak about here in the 360 Adjuster Academy, you know, it's all based off of expertise. So my, my, like I said, my advice is that if you're, if you're a new adjuster, go hourly because you're going to get paid regardless. But if you, if you know what you're doing, components. So those, those are my two biggest things, you know, what determining that. Thank you. All right, uh, Lamar, we're going to actually try to get through some of the panel stuff and then come back, back to questions. Will you remember yours or if you want to drop it in the chat to make sure you don't forget it? I want to make sure we get around to it, though, and that it doesn't change. So if that's uh, okay with you. Okay. I'll drop it in the chat. Right. All right. Thank you. All right, Sterling, circling back to you, sir. So the question is, what keeps your integrity compass centered? Let me give some context to that. I feel like in this world, right, in the Justin world, and sometimes even on calls, I'm on, like it comes up. Let's make sure, you know, our field teams aren't bluffing playing. You know, let's make sure people are writing. We're looking at quality, different things like that. So I feel like sometimes there's people's integrity that's definitely pulled to the carpet or looked at because, you know, there's a, some people out there, unfortunately, writing estimates, you know, for a little bit of everything that they know isn't involved in the claim. Or, you know, maybe they get intimidated by a contractor. So they're putting stuff on there that doesn't, you know, really line up with the the damages. How would you say or how would you advise other people that you keep your integrity compass very centered? Um, I would say <clears throat> be confident um, first in yourself and what you see with your own eyes. And then going forward on that, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't know, don't don't say anything you don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like just if you're feeling pressured from the contractor, okay, you know, don't argue back, don't fight with him. Hear what he says. All right, sir. I'll take a picture of it, whatever. I'll consult with my manager and leave it right there. Um, and I I think that'll help with your integrity because you're not pressured to uh promise anything. Um you know, go back and feel like, like you said, you have to make um, some damage up because the contractor said it was there. Um, and even if, you know what I'm saying, on the, if the contractor doesn't say anything, um, like marketing of damage just so, like if you're on a component, so you get paid more. Um, I think like just being able to be confident in what you're doing to the point where you know you win regardless. You know what I'm saying? Like doing the right thing, uh, whether that is writing a correct estimate, you know, saying the right thing, not promising things, uh, you know, I, I just think that doing those things would put you in a position where you don't have to compromise your integrity. Um, and you can just do your work straight. You know, obviously it's a stressful job, but like without that pressure of having to fabricate anything, in that sense, if that answers your question. Yes, sir. It does. Well, if that's your answer, it answers mine. But I will piggyback to something. So on the YouTube YouTube piece, did you tell us a few people that you watch on YouTube or a few different subjects? Sorry, I hate to circle back to that. I just no, want to make sure we I, can I drop, can, drop can, that knowledge. I can get them. Yeah, for sure. I can go and get them okay. for you um, and drop them in the chat. Perfect. I just think it'd be great to share. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Okay. All right, Travis. So what advice have you been given in this industry that you didn't follow, but now you wish you would have? Great question. Let me uh, think about that for one second. Uh, I can't say any because whatever I was told to do, I did it. I wanted to do it so bad. I wanted to be good at this opportunity so bad. When a deployment came around, I said yes. I didn't turn it down. I went ahead and said yes. Um, yeah, I said yes to everything that came my way because I wanted to do this thing so bad. I remember, well, my first actual assignment, it was from a company called Mad Sky. It was virtual assist, um, the adjuster on demand program. I had no idea what I was doing at all. Um, when I got involved in the industry, someone said, hey, you can go ahead and sign up for this company called Mad Sky and you can uh, go do virtual inspections, go and just take pictures. I said, what? Okay. They never did it. So I went ahead and signed up for it. And I uh, went, went, ahead and went out there. I had no idea what I was doing. I went out there. I had no ladder, had no equipment. I just showed up with my with my smartphone. I didn't know how to really use the program they had. It, I was all kind of ate up. But I just showed up and figured out as I, as I was going. But then I realized that being from a sales background and as a sales manager, the best trained 
salesperson wins. So the best trained adjuster is going to succeed the best. So I learned to just put more skin in the game by going and being uncomfortable and going to take the, the various classes that were available to me. Or those available, just got yeah, to look around and find it because this is your business. Uh, Coach Kedjoy, you said this uh, a few months back, that this is your, your own business. You have to invest in your mind in order to be successful. It's not going to just happen for you. So that's kind of what I have, Ms. Kedjoy. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. All right, Mr. Hill, you're back up, sir. It's a little bit of a, um, a lengthy question. So just let me know if you need me to repeat any of it. But what steps do you take when you show up to a home for an inspection and face some sort of unexpected challenges? It could have been a difficult, co difficult contractor or damages that were more extensive than you expected. Anything that comes to mind for you? We lose him. We might have lost him, huh? Mr. Neal. Oh, there he is. Maybe having some technical difficulty. Oh, there he is. Yes. I don't I don't know what's going on. Like, it's just keep my Wi-Fi is junk. I'm sorry. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, no problem at all. What steps do you take when you show up to a home inspection and face some unexpected challenges? For example, difficult contractor, damages are more extensive than you expected. Doesn't have to be about those. I'm just giving, you know, some ideas. Um, so challenges that I take is that I understand that I'm doing a job, a job, you know what I'm saying? Like, and what I mean by this is that like when it comes to dealing specifically like with contractors or PAs, like me specifically, I work with Chicago. So those of you that have experience working in Chicago, you know, it's like it's kind of like a different ball game up there with the, when it comes to the public adjusters and the contractors. Um, I've even had a gentleman who he tried to like corner me in, he threatened me, he he said, Oh, you from New Orleans, you think you big and tough. He called me fake Kevin Gates, he called me all type of stuff. You know, you you you're gonna deal <laughs> with a lot of stuff. Sound like you're fake. Yeah, like you gonna do a lot of stuff, a lot of challenges. So, um, how I deal with it is that I understand that I'm a professional. At the end of the day, I am uh, a representative of specifically as a, I I'm a representative of my company that I work for. But the the logo on the name, you know, the logo that's on the polo that I'm wearing, State Farm. That's who I work for. So. I approach those difficulties with the contractor as I'm not here to argue. I'm here to do my job. You know, um, when I get there, if the contractor tries to give me any type of, you know, uh, backlash or they say, oh, man, this and that, you know, I'm, I'm not worried about that. You know, I communicate in a, in a peaceful tone. I'm sorry, sir, that, you know, that won't see eye to eye. This is how I was trained, you know. And and this is my judgment on what I'm saying during my inspection. Keep it professional, and I, I communicate and let them know uh, what is going on. And you know, if they try to you know go back and forth with me, I'll say, sir, you know, I'm not here to argue. I'm going to continue, you know, my inspection. You continue yours. We'll communicate with the policyholders, and we'll move on from there. So that that's how I handle any type of you know situation with the contractor of that sort. You know, we one thing that I learned is that you can't get emotions involved, you know, when you're dealing with opposite parties. You know, they're they're gonna, you know, and, and I'll speak specifically, you know, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, and I grew up in a rough area. You know, where I'm from, don't wanna talk to you crazy, you know, I'm trying to square up. You know, I'm trying to you like it's like what's up, what you trying to do? But <laughs> me being a professional as well and a college educated, you know, young man. It's like I, I know not to do that. So you just have to handle yourself accordingly. Uh, and then when it comes to just, you know, getting to a, a property and you see a certain level of, of damages or, uh, you know, something that you might not even understand, how am I going to write this? Like, what do I even begin? Where do I start? The, the best thing that I, I would always do is I would just focus on what I can control. Hey, I'm here to investigate. I'm here to take pictures. 
I'm here to observe what the damages are and and you know I'm giving an estimate. I'm not here to tell you, hey, in order to fix this house, this tree that's falling in between your house, your your entire roof blown off, it's gonna cost you fifty thousand six hundred and sixty two dollars and twenty seven cents. I'm here to give you my observation. I'm writing for what I can see. So I go out there, and even if it's something that I don't know, the best thing that you're you're supposed to do is just document. You know, take take a great amount of photos. You go out there and you show what you see. You see what damages that there are there, and then from that point on, whatever you don't know how to write, there's always help on every deployment that you go on. There's always going to be an ABM which is a manager that you're always going to have trainers, you know, uh, specifically for, for everyone in here, you're always going to have the 360 adjuster Academy. You know, you, you have, you have a support system, you have help. So the best thing for you to do is, and this is one thing that I will mention, do not tell the contractor or the policyholder. Um, yeah, I mean, I really don't know what to say about, like this one, like I don't, I really can't tell. Like, never, never expose yourself when it comes to lack of knowledge. I will always say, okay, this does appear to be damaged, or X, Y, and Z. Oh, I do see that this occurred, but you know what? I will document this information, and I will go back and I will examine the photos with management. Even though a lot of times. I don't go over anything with my man, like with my managers, as far as like uh, uh, an inspection. You know, managers are extremely busy. You can't go and tell them, "Hey, I had this 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 uh, claim today, and I don't know anything that's going on with it." You know what I'm saying? You 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 always have to just make sure that you're wording things properly, specific, and and that goes both ways with contractors. That goes both ways with policyholders. That goes both ways when when you go to a house and you don't know what you're doing. All right, in the back of your head, you'd be like, what in the world? Like, I don't even know what to do, but it's like always appear to be knowledgeable. I never never show your weakness, you know? So I get there, and, I'm, and I might not know what I'm going to write for this, but I'm just documenting. You know, I'm doing my scope sheet. I'm taking my photos, you know, and then whatever I don't know, I'll figure out later. You know what I'm saying? So it's like the best thing for you to do is when you get to an op school like that, of that sort, don't allow yourself to be defeated. Don't be overwhelmed. You know, uh, not all of us have 15, 20 years of experience as an adjuster, you know? So just go out there and do the best that you can. Document what you can, and then you'll always have help. You'll always be able to get the situation resolved. So just stay out of your head, document, focus on what you can't control, and then let the, else, the rest be handled, you know, accordingly moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Hill, I appreciate that. So guys, uh, watching time, I'm gonna go two more questions, one with Travis, one with Sterling, and we'll wrap this up, make sure we get through any questions y'all have. So if y'all will bear with us, I really appreciate it. Mr. Travis, so how do you care for your mental health while on assignment? And how did you determine what helped the most? Mental health on assignment for me, started 20 years ago. What I mean by that is reading books, listening to good audio programs, watching your videos. So making sure that my mind is prepared for the blessing that God has before me by having it able to receive what was in front of me. Ricky would tell you, I used to sleep to audio tapes of someone speaking, like Les Brown speaking. I used to sleep, oh, he was like. That's right. I used to sleep to it. I wake up pumped, pumped up and excited about the day. So all everything that I believe that we've all done is a combination of readiness for where we are today. So whenever we get to those challenges in the field, first realize that it's going to be okay. Pausing, it's going to be okay. But also at the same time, I've seen this too. In this industry, if someone's working I want to make sure that say this to be true. You want to work to your level and your skill set. I mean by that is this. Do not do more than what you can close. Because yes, it sounds great and sounds pretty. Yeah, you can go out and make 20, 40, 50,000, whatever it is in a month, 100,000 a month. But you have the skill set to do that. 
If you have the skill set to only close one or two a day, that's okay. Do that and keep getting better. So not putting yourself in imposition to be shy from a mental perspective, but also at the same time as well, um, making sure that your, the, your people around you know what's going on like from home. Let them know that you are working. Don't bother me. I have this going on. I'm actually out producing. And make sure that, you know, get off their phone. Do not allow for the phone to kill you. What I mean by that is social media is cool, but while you're working, work. Schedule your time accordingly. Schedule your time accordingly. If you're not going to work this time period, don't work at that time period. So that's what I have. To make sure that you keep putting good information into your brain. And also, more importantly, keep showing up to laboratory redemption. This right here is a big deal. Because what will happen is you're having a good week. This meeting actually needs you. You're having a bad week. This meeting absolutely needs you. And then you need the meeting as well. Only because... All the other thing I hear is, hey, man, you're going to be okay. Someone tells you that and they mean it, everything changes. Am I right about it? Yes or yes? Boom. That's right. Drop the mic on that one, cool. Right, I'm, I'm done. I'm just talking junk. Uh, thank you, Travis. All right, we'll take that. All right, Mr. Sterling, so last question goes to you, sir. What word would you use to describe your first year in the field and why? Second part of that is... Anything different you could have done to spring into action that would have changed that? So I'll definitely repeat this, you know, whatever you need to on that. But first part of that is what word would you use to describe your first year in the field and why? Okay, so I like this question. My, the word I would pick would be perseverance. And a large part of that is because before I got on first deployment, um, I was going through like a lot mentally. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I got laid off from my job. And um and I was like at the start of the year. So like from, imagine like the whole start of the year into the summer, you know, making no money, you know what I'm saying? To the point where you reaching in your pocket, you got lint balls. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, like it's just it was tough mentally, you know what I'm saying? And uh I was really like eager to work. Like my friends are working as well already and um uh, so Major just one day called me, introduced me to Travis. I talked to Travis and Travis like like literally like just poured it into my cup. And like it kind of like, you know, it gave me that resolve, that mental focus, like I was doing all this for a reason. You know what I'm saying? All this happened. I was going through the mud. I was going through this downslide for a reason. It refocused me, you know what I'm saying? Uh, helped me uh Put the important things first. Like in this time, like I was, I was really moving intentionally. Like I would wake up every day, doing anything and everything I could to be an adjuster. Whether that's you know calling any number that Trevor, Travis gave me, calling it like a hundred times till I called and I'm going straight to voicemail. You know, reading something, trying to find a free course because I didn't have any money. Like just literally YouTube, like anything that I could gain knowledge wise. I was, I was hungry for it, and um, that helped build me up, you know, to be, you know, for my perseverance. Like so when I finally got the deployment, um, like it felt good getting it, but then I noticed like the pressure of having, like, to be on a deployment and actually the work you had to put in. So like it didn't just stop there because I got it. Like I had to persevere through. It. Like when I first got to Minneapolis, my first couple of days were rough, and you know what I'm saying, like. I just had to tell myself, like, I was, I would stop, take a deep breath, be like, you know, like, this is what I asked for, you know, like, I wanted to be here in this moment, you know, so I just was embracing everything, like, the good and the bad, and I had Janae, Travis, Major, Kayvon, like, they're all calling, checking in on me, you know, so, like, I would definitely say perseverance. Thank you for that transparency. Is there anything different you feel like you could have done to spring into action that would have changed that? Um, I don't want to say too much differently other than like, I guess the courses I would say, like trying to prioritize um, finding more, you know, courses to put on my resume, uh, anything to beef my resume up, you know, like, 
that's what I would say I could have done differently. Uh, but uh, that's what I would say. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. So that's going to finish up the panel. I want to make sure, um, one, to just say thank you for everyone sharing so genuinely and transparently. Um, definitely love the last one of those parts you said, you know, Travis has, our CEO has done a great job of pouring into as many of us as he can, which definitely continues to show his vision is just his heart. So just a kind thank you out to him and then to the entire panel. I think y'all did an incredible job. I know we had a question in the chat for um, from Lamar and said, and so this will be for anybody that can answer that. As a new adjuster, it is damaging to turn, is it damaging to turn down deployments? Anyone that's open. I'm, that. I'm not gonna say it's damaging, but it's stunting of your growth. I say that because you have no idea what you're doing anyway. <laughs> you know, you, just, you gotta get out there, meet the people, because you never know what, what, what could happen. If we think about it, like for instance, Janae, she had no idea what she was doing. She went out there and then she had a skateboard from what I was told by Demetrio. She had a skateboard. Why we but, gotta bring up the skateboard? Because Man. it's funny as heck to me. That's funny. She was riding on a skateboard to other people. That's well, crazy. you know, she, she had to have transportation. You know? <laughs> That's okay, though. She's riding her vans. You know, I'm sorry. So, but yeah, get out there. Meet the people, right? Because you never know who you connect with. So get out there and say yes to the opportunity. Because if you say no, the opportunity may not come back to you for a long, long time. You have no idea what could happen. So I'll just say, say yes to an opportunity. Because you prayed for it. You spent money for it. Got your license for it. You went through the hell mentally for it. Why not receive it? Because you put the work in to get it. I guess that I guess that makes sense to me. Because Demetrio did when he went out. He had no idea what he was doing, but he said yes, and he ended up in Florida with a telescopic ladder and a and a and a Volkswagen Beetle. So, yes, sir. He had no he had no idea. He had no idea. He just said yes. I was scared. I was scared though. I was like, okay, I can do it. You know, just driving nervous. You know. Yeah, it definitely don't hurt. It it hurt to, it hurt you financially. Uh, you know, get them books. You want your money? Get out there. You get out of the deployment. You know, especially if you just not starting out, man. You know, you know all of those variables. I don't know. That's not enough. That's this that. Nah. When you starting out, man, you get out there and you get your name known. You get your work known. You know, you get out there and make yourself known too. So when the next time they come, you're gonna be at the top. You're on the A team. You know, they they know your work. They know your stuff, and they would have never known if you don't get up out there and go. So go out there and get to work and uh, make your name known, get the experience, oh, and, and get the money. Thanks, Meech. Mr. Larry, what question do you have for the team? Um, as I'm preparing myself to get ready for what is in store, um, I've been trying to find some of the supplies and things. Um, what are some good places and good brand names of things uh, to get? You know what I'm saying? I can go to anyone. So anyone that can answer or would like to share, please. I could. Uh, oh. oh, there we go, Major. You good? Right. I, I was saying I, I could speak a little bit to that. Uh, really like towards the, the more expensive items. Uh, like I, what I usually do, I, I, like if I don't have like a like if I'm not driving all the way up to my deployment, I would um usually like go to go to Lowe's and like get like my get like my ladder or like the uh, my, like my ladder clips and things like that. And then like when, once the deployment is over, I usually like uh, go back to the Lowe's and then uh, they, they'll let you return it and you get your money back for it as well. Okay. That boy scheming right there, boy. I see you, man. <laughs> That's right, man. If you go out there, you're gonna make some money. You're gonna be able to get your own ladder though. Well, I, I have a ladder. I'm like I said, I'm in Rifting construction already. So I have a ladder, you know, I have cougar paws, you know, I got all that stuff. Um, I guess um I was that's I was more looking for like name brands of like 
lasers and yeah, that's your preference stuff. though. Yeah, that's your yeah. preference. That stuff like that. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Whatever yeah, you in your hand. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. I know uh Larry, there's a uh a, a steep steepgear.com, steep gear. Uh I know they got some things some things on there, you know, for when when you're dealing with uh steep uh, high steep roofs, you know, shorts, gloves, pants. Uh Tyree mentioned last week, you know, the deal with the on the on the pants and things of that nature. Right. Uh, right, right. so yeah, yeah. You go to steepgear.com specifically, I know they have some things. Uh, you know that you, that you may want to check out, man, when you get out there. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right, team. Anyone else that has questions that we can help answer for you? Questions, concerns, things we haven't thought of addressing for you guys. Say great job, K Joy. Those questions Thank were you. very, very good. Thank you, man. Yeah. Good job. I'm definitely turning it. Thank you. Turning it back over to you guys for sure. Appreciate it. Good job. Great job, guys. Yes, and don't right. put too much pressure on yourself. Don't do that to yourself. I've seen people in the war rooms, they'll turn to pink because they have so much pressure. And I'm like, dude, you're going you gonna to have a stroke, bro. You got to relax. It's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it started, Jay. Dang. Oh, man. So, yeah, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Don't do that to yourself. It's, it is just an insurance claim. It's okay. It's just an insurance claim. You're going to be all right. But I'll go ahead and uh, pass the mic now. Yes, all right. Well, so back to Janae and Kevon. Janae, you, you, you good, Janae? Yeah, I thought I thought Kevon was going to close us out. But um, before we go, I just want to say, I just want to um, touch on what Kevon said earlier about the feedback forms. We have been uh, getting your request, and we're trying to implement different things from for each uh, call. So we'll we'll definitely have a few of those um, those things that you requested, just like how to do an inspection um, properly, walk through that, um, file reviews and stuff like that. So just, you know, keep posted on um, what we have coming up in the following weeks. And please continue to fill out the feedback form whenever you get a chance. Check out our social medias too. Check them out, they're good. Check yes. And like I said, go go rewatch that last um, episode of the last call from last week. You if you broke it, it down. Equipment breakdown, yes sir. I rewatched yeah. it, it was good. Yeah, it was very good. Yeah, yeah, on the salmon shirt, he was fancy. <laughs> salmon, salmon, with the L. Salmon, salmon. Here, huh? yeah, man. Salmon. I got my black one all day, baby. You know what I'm saying? You gotta be on the street team to get through church like Travis. You gotta get on the street team. Street team. Oh man, yeah, uh, time, boy, get the boy stuck in the yard. Look at them. He's stuck in the yard, boy. I can't. Let's start, ain't he? <laughs> oh. <laughs> But well, yeah, like I said, uh, next week, next week we got um, the lovely K Joy, you know, gracing us with her presence again. Hopefully, dropping some mm -hmm. good gems from a managerial perspective. So please stay tuned for that. Yeah, get, yeah. Get some questions time, prepared for that. Time. Yeah. But otherwise, oh. thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Absolutely. Us. Yeah, brother Julius, thank you for jumping on, brother Julius. We look forward to you working with us and Sister Ball. We appreciate you, Tyree. Yeah. Appreciate you. Larry Legend. Dylan, appreciate you. K Joy, thank you. Ricky, Major, everybody right. on DJ. here. Yeah, everything, DJ. everything was good Yo, this evening. Appreciate you. Hey, go Mavericks. <laughs> you know what I'm saying?